<clears throat> I suppose you can imagine that uh, you know, after you've been somewhere where you've heard 15 or 20 of the better, best expositors in the whole world for a whole week, it's intimidating to come on Sunday and think, I got to preach. Um, that's why I usually don't preach when I've been away at a conference. I need a week to recover. But um, today, it wasn't planned that way, so here we are. I'm reminded of what I think it was Spurgeon said of Moody. He said, he may preach the gospel better than I, but he cannot preach a better gospel than I. And that's what we cling to this morning. So would you stand with me as we look at our passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, and we're reading beginning in verse... Um, I'm sorry, Luke 20, that'll help. If I get to, that's a good start if I go to the right passage, probably, right? Luke 20. Didn't think that looked quite right. Now let's try beginning in verse 41. But he said to them, How can you say that the Christ is David's son? David himself says, in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? Let's pray. Our Father, <clears throat> we thank you in this brief passage uh, that there is so much. Pray that Today, you will illumine our hearts to understand the meaning and to apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I don't think it's even arguable, really, that no one has affected human history like Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You might find a few who would like to argue that point, but I think they would quickly realize they cannot defend that position. Something between 60 and 100 billion people estimated to have occupied this planet at one time or another. That's a lot of people. And yet out of all of those, here is one who is the supreme person of all. It's Jesus of Nazareth, who has that accolade that can be applied to him. Even a skeptic like H.G. Wells said of Jesus that he is easily the dominant figure of history. Easily the dominant figure of history. He concluded that no historian could convey the progress of humanity honestly without giving Jesus, quote, the foremost place. Pretty strong accolade, isn't it? So I think it raises the question, well, but, but who is Jesus and why is that true? What is it that makes him stand out? What is it about him that is so overwhelming? Who is he really? I don't think we have to dig very far in history to find that people have turned Jesus mainly into whoever they wanted him to be. Islam defines him, identifies him simply as a prophet who did not die on the cross and was, while a prophet, inferior to Muhammad. To the Mormons, he is a created being, the spirit brother of Satan. To Jehovah's Witnesses, he is Michael the Archangel incarnate. To rock musicians and postmodern intellectuals, he is a countercultural hero. But just a man in my day, my generation, he was some kind of a super hippie. That's basically the way, way I remember him being identified in my youth. Others have, I, have reinvented him as a cynical philosopher, a social critic, a political activist, a misguided martyr, 
I read one book by a guy who made him really the greatest businessman in history. If you want to make it up, you can turn Jesus into whoever you want to, right? But beloved, I think that leaves two of the most important questions about Jesus' identity on the table. The first question is, who did Jesus himself know himself to be? That's a good question, right? Who did Jesus know himself to be? And the second question that would come with that is, who do you accept Jesus to be? Who is he to you? The Bible affirms that our eternal destiny hangs in the balance in how we deal with those two questions. It makes Jesus' person the central point of eternal salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, John says, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The lines are so clearly drawn. I see people all the time who want to have God, but they don't want to have Jesus. Or they want to have God, and they believe that God is deity, but Jesus is just a man. You cannot do that. You cannot separate them. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus is going to come back to that question in this passage of Scripture. This is the last week of his life. Very likely, as best I can tell, this is probably the last day of his earthly ministry. He has now demolished the arguments of all of his enemies who have come and asked him questions thinking to, thinking to fool him, thinking to discredit him, taking every advantage they can to try and make him look bad before the people who at the moment are still treating him as kind of, as kind of a rock star of some kind. With all their best challenges, Jesus has, Jesus has met them all with, without them putting a chink in his armor. He's turned them all away. And so they, finding that they cannot handle his answers, are about to find out they can't handle his questions either. There's a question for them. His question is, how do you say that the Christ is David's son? That sounds like a simple question, doesn't it? How do you say Christ is David's son? Where is that question coming from? And who, by the way, is they and who is them in this statement? Well, if we were to go to, Ma to Mark chapter 12, we would find that they who are asking the question are the scribes. The scribes, as you recall, are the sort of elite Pharisees, the more educated Pharisees, those who know the law, the inside and out of the additions to the law of God that the Pharisees have made over time. They are the ones that he is asking, and the them, I think, is the whole crowd. So he's saying to the whole crowd of people that are around him, how is it that your scribes, that your leaders here, how is it that they say that Christ is David's son? They would have probably answered, well, everybody knows that. The Old Testament teaches us that. But Jesus has asked this question in order to make a very stunning point. He knew that virtually everyone in his day and time accepted the Messiah, this great anointed one who would come that's identified in the Old Testament as being David's son. He knew that. He knew it was part of the Davidic promise in 2 Samuel 7. So Jesus' question would have sounded a bit strange. How can they say that Christ is David's son? The obvious answer, because in the Old Testament, it is taught, because the prophets have taught it. But Jesus had a profound reason for asking this question. This is a lead-in to something much more. It's a lead-in to something much more. He's going to answer the question, ultimate question, who does Jesus know himself to be? Who does Jesus know himself to be? 
And then the second question, who do you accept Jesus to be? Well, that one's up to you and me, right? It's up to you and me. But let's get the first one down, and then maybe we can deal with the second one. Who is Jesus? Now, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture today, and I think it would be good if you have a Bible, I trust you do, to uh, look at some of these just so you can see the truth of what we will do here. Keep your place in uh, Luke 20, but we'll go through several passages of Scripture here. Jesus' question raises the question, how do they say that, they, that Messiah is, is the Christ, which is the Greek term for Messiah, how do they say that he is David's son? The answer would have been, well, that's taught in Scripture. How can they say it's true? Because it's there. That's part of the requirement for the Messiah, in fact, that he be David's son. So let's start in 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16. This is where David wanted to build a temple for God. He wanted to put the Ark of the Covenant that... He had retrieved and brought it to Jerusalem. He wanted to build a temple around it. And God, through the prophet Nathan, said, David, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. You're a man of blood. You cannot build a temple for me. But I would have, will build a house for you. And so we have this great Davidic covenant, one of several great covenants in the Old Testament. And this one deals with the lineage of, of a royal line in Israel through David. And he says to David in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So we know that God has promised that there will be some kind of descendant of David on the throne in Israel permanently, eventually. David refers to that promise in Psalm 89. He comes back to it, thinking of it later when he writes one of the Psalms. And so in Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4, David says this. He says, You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Now, the interesting thing about that verse is we take a step forward because the word offspring there is singular. I will establish your offspring. Singular. Huge promise. There's going to be somebody, some one body, who is a descendant of yours, who will sit on your throne for all generations, a throne forever for the Messiah. Other prophets pick up the theme in Isaiah as we move a little further forward. Chapter 9, we have this great. I, you know, I've been waiting. Someday I'm going to, I want to preach on this at Christmas time. I, uh, this is one of those passages of scripture, though, that you feel totally inadequate for. <laughs> every Christmas, I think, maybe this year, and every Christmas, I think, no, not yet. Um, so uh, one day, if I ever preach on it, it won't be because I really feel adequate, but the Lord somehow encouraged me that I should do it Hasn't happened yet. Listen to this passage, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. What a promise. 
I mean, can you imagine some one person who incorporates all of this in his person? But God says he's coming. He will be of the throne of David. He will be a descendant of David, and he will occupy that throne, and he will occupy it forever. Isaiah 11, verse 1. A great chapter that looks forward to heaven on earth when that time comes. But here in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, it's David's father. There will come a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch, that is David's branch from his roots, shall bear fruit. Another promise that this is all coming through the line of David. Jeremiah picks up the same theme in chapter 23, verse 5. And Jeremiah, 100 years later, says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Same same basic promise is repeated in Jeremiah 33, 15. Why did the scribes say that Messiah would be David's son? Because it was all over the Old Testament. You couldn't miss it. This is why, this is why both Matthew and Luke were at pains to establish the genealogy of Jesus. Why? Because they needed to show that Jesus is in the, fits the line of this Messiah, this one who has been promised is going to come as a, as a part of the line of David. Jesus fits that pattern. And so Matthew starts his genealogy. In Matthew 1, verse 1, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham. And then he traces him all the way back to Abraham. He's showing Jesus' connection as a descendant of David because it was important that the Messiah be identified as a descendant of David. Luke's genealogy in chapter 3 of Luke, between verses 23 and 38, Luke takes the genealogy of Christ all the way back to Adam. But he comes back through the line of David. I believe there's a little confusion on those genealogies, but I believe that, that Matthew's is clearly the genealogy of Joseph showing David's legal right to the throne. And I believe the one in Luke shows the genealogy through Mary showing his biological right to the throne, even as a man, his human nature coming through Mary. He was a descendant of David, so Jesus clearly meets the messianic requirement to be a son of God. Up to, uh, to be a, a son of David. Turn further with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We have these interesting words where we see the importance of this fact as well. In John 7, beginning in verse 40, We read this. It says, When they learned these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Now, if you understand that back in Deuteronomy, Moses at the end of his life prophesied that there would come a prophet in Israel even greater than him. It was a prophecy of the Messiah. But he was just called a prophet there. And the Jewish people knew that. They knew there was supposed to be a prophet coming. So they were always looking for the prophet. The prophet. And that's why they refer here. Could it be that this is the guy? Maybe this is the one. Others said this is the Christ, the Messiah. But some said, is the Messiah to come from Galilee? Has the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring? Has not the Scripture said that the, that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? They're referring to Matthew 5, 2, which clearly indicates that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. 
And they don't know that. So there was a division among the people over him. Many of them did not realize he had been born in Bethlehem. Why? Because he came from Galilee. He talked with a Galilean accent. As far as they knew, that was his heritage. They didn't have the book of Luke like we do to inform us that God used the most powerful man on earth, Caesar Augustus, to declare that there be a tax that took Mary and Joseph from Galilee to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born in the right place. They didn't know that. But you can see conclusively here that the expectations of the people regarding the Messiah were, was that he would be an offspring of David and that he would come from Bethlehem. They were confused about Jesus because they had known him only as a Galilean where he had lived most of his life. Jesus himself talks about the importance of his descendant, descendants from David. And in, in Revelation 22, verse 16, he says, I, Jesus, this is the last chapter in the Bible, beloved, it's important. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David the bright and morning star. So how could the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? Because he was. And because Jesus fit this description to a T. All that had been established in the Old Testament about the Messiah and his human lineage through David was established in the person of Christ. Through his human lineage, Jesus' person is established as fully man as, and as one to be qualified by his birth as the king and as the Messiah. But here's the problem. Whereas the people of Jesus' time had no further definition of their own Messiah, than that he would be a great man coming through the descendant as a descendant of David. They had no further definition of their own Messiah. Jesus did have a further definition of the Messiah. They didn't. He did. They should have because he got it from the same place they did, from this, or should have, from the Scripture. Remember how Jesus constantly referred people back to Scripture. The more you read his life, do you see how he constantly goes back to Scripture for himself and for others? We saw it last, uh, last week when we were together, how Jesus took those men on the road to Emmaus. He didn't just jump out in front of them and say, here I am. He pointed them back to Scripture and said, listen, here's how Scripture is fulfilled in my life. This was all about me. But it's from Scripture that he takes them. It is Scripture that he points us to. It is Scripture that he used to defeat the Sadducees who thought the part of the Scripture that they accepted didn't have the resurrection, and lo and behold, there it was the whole time. Beloved, the lessons there are so hard for us. We must be students of Scripture. I don't care who you are as a Christian. I don't care how smart or not smart you are. I don't care how much you like to read or you don't like to read. You must be a student of Scripture. You must. This is your lifeline. This is the revelation of God. And Jesus rebukes people for not knowing what's there. And he rebukes them for not knowing some of the stuff that's not exactly the surface stuff. Are you with me? You should have known this, he says. You should have known this. It was there in plain sight and you didn't study it out. And that's what he's going to do right here, right out of their own scripture. Jesus is going to show that Messiah is not merely David's son. He is something much more. Something that Jesus' contemporaries had never even considered. Yes, he's David's son. But he's a lot more than that. He's David's Lord. He's David's Lord. And that comes as a weighted description of who Messiah is and as a weighted description of who Jesus is. So he asked him the question back in Luke 20. He 
It says in, uh, in verse 42, for David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's a quotation from the 110th Psalm, so we should probably turn there. Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament, and Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted verse in the New Testament. So obviously it's important. Now when you read that question at first, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I have made enemies, your enemies your footstool. It sounds a little convoluted, doesn't it? What in the world is Jesus trying to say here? Well, if you look at the quotation in Psalm 110, you'll see it's the same as Jesus has quoted it. Everything hinges on that phrase, the Lord said to my Lord, right? The Lord said to my Lord. Everything hinges on that. Why are there two lords in the same verse, in the same sentence? How how can that be? Who is David specifically referring to as his Lord? Both the Jews and Jesus recognize that this psalm is talking about Messiah. It's talking about the son of David who would rule on his throne. But in the Jewish mind, it was absolutely unthinkable that any human father would refer to his son as his Lord. That would have been unthinkable. Unthinkable. The father in the Jewish culture was dominant. He would have never referred to his son as something superior to him. And here is a king, David, not just a father, but the greatest king in the history of Israel, the founder of the whole dynasty, saying something that implies this Messiah who's going to be his son is his Lord. How could he do that? So how did the Jews answer that question? They didn't. He just glossed it over like it wasn't even there. Have you ever done that with a passage of Scripture? I don't understand this. I think I'll just move on. Now, we don't all understand every passage of Scripture we ever read, right? I certainly don't. I assume you don't either. But, beloved, we need to dig and dig and dig and and work at it, right? It's not a good excuse to say, I'm just going to leave it. But that's what the Jews Jews of Jesus' time had done with this passage. They didn't know what to do with it. So how are we to interpret David's calling Messiah his Lord? What does this mean to us? Well, first of all, it'll help us, I think, to know that there are two different Hebrew words that are used here. If you're in Psalm 110, look at that closely. And you'll notice the Lord says to my Lord. Notice the first Lord, depending on your translation, but almost certainly it's capitalized. It's capitalized. The reason it's capitalized, if you have an understanding of the Old Testament, I think almost all English versions do this. There may be some obscure version that doesn't, but I think they all do this. The word Yahweh, the Hebrew word Yahweh, is always capitalized. So when you see the word Lord in capital letters, it's got a big L, and then it's got a, you know, a smaller O, but it's still a capital O. And then it's got a smaller R, but it's a capital R. That's the way the Old Testament clues you this is the word Yahweh. Jehovah is the Germanized version of it that's sort of come down to us. The Jewish people considered this word so sacred they wouldn't say it out loud. So when they came in their Hebrew readings to the word Yahweh in the Old Testament, they would read Adonai, the second word that we're going to see. Yahweh was a sacred name. Why was it a sacred name? Go back to Exodus 3, right? When God is sending Moses down to deliver the children of Israel who are down in Egypt, and, they, and Moses says, well, okay, fine, but who am I going to say sent me? I need a name. Remember what God said? Really strange quote, right? Tell them I am sent you. 
Tell them a verb sent me? I mean, come on. I am. Yahweh is basically built on the Hebrew verb to be. I am. This is why every time you see Jesus saying, I am, in the New Testament, you're basically seeing a claim of deity. Most of the time he makes that somewhat clear. But I am this, that, and the other thing, it's a claim of deity. I am as God, as Jehovah, I am the bread of life. As God, as Jehovah, I am the door. As God, as Jehovah. Sometimes he just says, I am. Remember how he said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I was. Could have. Why did he say I am? Because he was giving himself the name of God. And that's what is going on here, the word God, Yahweh, is used as the first word in that verse, in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, Yahweh. The Lord says to my Lord. So David is the one speaking. He's saying, the Lord, Yahweh, the great God. This is the, Yahweh is the name for God. The second Lord there, which is not capitalized, is the word Adonai. Now, whereas Jehovah is the name for God, Adonai is kind of, think of Adonai as a title for God. It's still a valid name, but it's, it's, it's more like a title, and it's emphasizing his greatness. Notice how he talks about, my, I'll, I'll make your enemies your footstool. This Adonai is the great almighty God. This is the emphasis on, uh, with, with that name. And so here you have Jehovah God saying to David's Lord, David's Adonai. I will make your enemies your footstool. And all the world knew that that Adonai, that second Adonai, is the Messiah. He's the one who's David's son. He's the one who's going to have his enemies as his footstool. But what they don't understand is how can, they be two Adon- how can there be two lords? How can there be a Jehovah and an Adonai? And they're different. One is talking to the other one. How can that be? Well, how can that be? It can only be, beloved, because there is not just the unity of God, there's also the triunity of God, right? God is a trinity. God is one, and yet God is three. God is one in being, three in person, we say, from a theological standpoint, because we don't have any better way to explain it. We have a God who is absolutely one in his unity of, of, of essence, of being, and yet he is three in terms of his personal manifestations. Three wills that are actually one. Three abilities to understand. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they communicate with each other. What did, what did Jesus constantly say when he was here on earth? I've been talking to my Father, right? I'm doing the will of my Father. His will was subordinate to the will of the Father. He was absolutely, you know, from a human standpoint, we'd say paranoid. He wasn't, but he was paranoid that he wasn't going to do the will of his Father. And we think we can get away without doing the will of the Father. How stupid, right? I need to do the will of my Father. The only way this passage can be understood and explained is because there is a trinity. The problem was the Jews of Jesus' day had no concept of trinity, right? They, their, their, the, their theology started and ended with the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, the one we memorized earlier. The Lord, Hear, O Israel, know the Lord your God is what? One. One Lord. And they'd gone to the bank with that. They had missed the the clues in the Old Testament. What's, what's interesting to me, the Trinity is not an easy concept, right? Let's, let's face it. It's not easy for us to understand. It's not easy for us to get this through our minds. And here's people who don't even have the New Testament, which gives us further indication of that, and yet Jesus is teaching the Trinity right to these Jewish people, right out of Psalm 110. Because he wants them to realize what? That when he says, I am God, he meant it. He wasn't kidding. So he has the Lord, Yahweh, saying to David's Lord, Adonai. 
which was Jesus himself, of course, pre-incarnate. Wow. So Jewish people of Jesus' time didn't have a concept of Trinity, but what? Jesus did. Why? Because he's part of it. One hard for him, right? Except, remember that he's, he's living his earthly life on the basis only of his humanity. He doesn't lose his deity, but he's not depending on his deity. He's not, he's not calling on his deity. He's not using his deity. So how did Jesus figure out there's a trinity? Psalm 110. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. And he grew spiritually and he grew in favor with God and man because he was just like us and he learned just like we can learn. Powerful stuff, isn't it? So in Jesus' interpretation of this passage is really simple. It is that God the Father is saying to God the Son who is David's Lord, I'm going to make your enemies be your footstool. That's why David called him Lord, because he is Lord. David called him Lord because David understood something the Jewish people of his time didn't understand. He understood that his son was also his Lord. I don't know how David got that. I don't know how David understood that, other than it's the revelation of God that God gave him, right? So David could call him Adonai, because he is David's Lord who also becomes David's son at the time of the incarnation. The Jews in Jesus' time believed that Messiah would be a great man, the son of David. What Jesus is showing them from their own scripture is that Messiah, while certainly being the son of David, is also so much more, so much more. He is, in fact, Adonai. He is God. And since Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, as he directly told the woman at the well in John 14, 26, remember when she came back and, and she said, well, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to do all this stuff. And Jesus looked her straight in the eye and said, I am he. First revelation that Jesus is the Messiah was made to that woman at the well. Jesus loves the underprivileged, doesn't he? I'm he. I who talk to you am he. She became a believer and brought half the town to Christ. Wow. Since Jesus claimed to be the Messiah as he did to that woman at the well, and his enemies knew that very well, he is now showing that he is not merely the son of David as a man, but he is also the Lord of David as God in the flesh. And that, beloved, is why they killed him. If you look through the passages of Scripture very carefully, you will see that the reason Jesus was killed was because he kept insisting that he was God. He kept in various ways and in, in, in various ways and in various uh, manners basically saying that he was God, and that's what they could not stand. But the whole point of the incarnation was that the second person of the triune Godhead took on human flesh, became fully God and fully man in one unique person, and he is indeed Emmanuel, God with us. He is indeed David's son, but he's also David's Lord. That is who Jesus knew himself to be. And nothing less than that will ever be acceptable. You cannot say Jesus is a great prophet and Jesus is a wonderful man and say, but I cannot ever accept him as God. You have just condemned yourself. And you have certainly flown in the face of what Jesus knew about himself. He understood himself to be the Son of God. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like a kid taking a balloon and trying to, trying to pound it into a box, right? And it's not quite won't quite fit. It's too big. He needs a bigger box. And the Jewish people in Jesus' time needed a bigger box, and we need a bigger box. There's no box, actually, that's ever big enough for Jesus. Jesus is so wonderful. Jesus is so amazing. We will never totally understand Jesus, but we can say this. Jesus is both God and man at the same time, so that when Jesus says, for 
God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him, believes into Him literally, believes everything that there is about Him, believes all that there is to be known about Him, that He is both God and man and that He died to pay for the sins of the world. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. It doesn't mean to just believe a few facts. It means to commit your whole life to this person as the Son of God who has died to take away my sins. You have to take him all or you do not take him at all. He is David's son, truly man. But he is also David's Lord, truly and fully God. Now we cannot leave that scripture without pointing out one more thing. He is our Lord. He is our Lord. Turn with me to Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul comes back to this same theme. In verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see the same thing there. You see Jesus as fully human. You see Jesus as fully God. And then Paul says, and by the way, he's not just David's Lord. He is our Lord. So who is our, verse 6, including you who are called to belong to Christ. You who are called to belong to Christ. He's your Lord. So are we, so is everybody called? No, not everyone. Not everyone. Not everyone. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to every one who believes. We're back to the believes again. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in the righteousness, for in the for it is for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Who are the called? Those who are starting a new life in faith, and those who are continuing the new life in faith. They are the called. You say, well, what if I'm not called? We're called as we get our word election from it. What if I'm not elected? Beloved, the answer to that question is none of us can do anything about God's calling, right? God is sovereign. I can't change him, you can't change him, but you and I all can do something about whether we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And one day in heaven... Before the judgment seat of Christ, the question will be, did you, not did God elect you, but the question will be, did you, by an act of the freedom of choice that God has given you, the wonderful gift of choice, did you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or did you just mess around the edges? Did you make yourself feel good by going to church? Did you ascribe, yeah, I know Jesus is God, but he never affected your life, ever. How do you make your calling sure? Luke 9, 22. We saw it. It's so clear there. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him or her take up their cross daily. Die to self daily and follow me. That's the person who loves the crucified and risen Christ, and that's the person who is a true Christ 
follower. We've been memorizing the passage in Philippians 2. At one level, Jesus Christ is the Lord of everyone who ever lived. Objectively, He is. No one, at the end of the day, will do anything other than what Jesus wants them to do. But subjectively, He is especially the Lord of those who will come by faith and say, here's my life, I give it to you, I want to live it for you. But we will all bow the knee to Christ. That's why our, you know, our scripture memory verse says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of, of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God will get the glory one day when Hitler re, 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 recites the fact that Jesus is Lord. Stalin will recite the fact that Jesus is Lord, but it will be too late on the way to an eternity of separation from Him. The only time that it counts is now. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. That's what will change your eternal status. But it's the only thing. The great British theologian John Stott, he died in 2011, not very long ago. He was a great... Wonderful man of God. He wrote about a teenage boy one time who was kind of a rounder. You know, he was one of those kids that they sent away to the boarding school in England because he had been uh, he was un unmanageable at home. And the boarding schools were not exactly uh, a place to send a kid who, was, who, who didn't want to get in trouble because they did pretty well there. They just learned how to cover it up very well at those places. But this young man heard the gospel of Christ. At the age of 15, one night, he bowed before his bed, and he wrote in his diary this. He said, yesterday really was an eventful day. Up until now, Christ had been the, on the circumference. And I have been asking him to guide me instead of giving him complete control. Behold, he stands at the door and knocks. I have heard him, and now he has come into my house. He has cleansed it and now rules in it. The next day he added this. He said, I really have felt an immense and new joy throughout today. It is the joy of being at peace with the world and of being in touch with God. How well do I know now that he rules me and that I never really knew him before. Do you know Jesus? Do you love him? Do you know how much he loves you? That diary entry, of course, was the one of John Stott himself describing the beginning of his Christian journey, how he came to faith in Christ. Stott had wanted to just use Jesus for his own purpose. If Jesus is to you just a, just a ticket to get out of hell and into heaven, I have news for you. You're not saved. Saved people love Jesus. They don't come to Him as Lord as the hardest thing in their life. They come to Him as Lord because His burden is easy. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And they've recognized whatever I have to give up is, is way worth it to get something this valuable. That's the person who knows Jesus. I hope you know Jesus. If you don't, why not today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We are astounded at how well you knew the Old Testament. I imagine you must have had it memorized. And you not only knew what it said, you knew what it meant. You understood the implications. You understood things that other people had just glossed over because they didn't know what to do with them. And you understood yourself to be fully God and fully man. And so we must accept you if we would have eternal life as the one who has died to pay the penalty for the sin that we could never pay for otherwise. Accepting you as our Lord, not just the Lord, 
but our Lord. Would you please, right now, open the heart of anyone here who does not know you. Cause them to be overwhelmed with the holiness of God and how far short they fall of it, just like we all do. And cause them to be overwhelmed with the thought that Jesus came to die, to pay the penalty for their sin. And then rose again, demonstrating that the Father accepted every bit of that work to pay the price. Thank you for that. Lord, as we close now and sing this little song together, He is Lord. I pray it will be the prayer of every heart here. Don't let one person go out the door without knowing you. And if they don't understand, please give them the courage to come and say, could you talk to me a little more? Could you? We just give them some reading material if that's all they want that would help them understand a little more clearly what it means to know Jesus Christ. Bless us as we sing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.